Welcome to Christie's and our upcoming auction, Home Plate, which will be taking place next Wednesday the 16th at Christie's. I'm Liz Siegel, a specialist in our private and iconic collections department, and I'm thrilled to introduce Dave Hunt of, Dave, of Hunt Auctions, who are partnering with for this exciting sale. We are thrilled to be here. Very incredible collection uh, that was assembled by this private collector over really 30 plus years. Uh, just an exciting venue and bring it to the public. So here we are. Let's show you around. So obviously you've got a number of great different genres. We're going to focus on some, on just a few of the pieces since the collection is so expansive, but there's advertising pieces, photography, vintage trading cards, correspondence, and even game used bats and jerseys from the greatest players in the game, like Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth. Yeah, actually they're two of our real heavy hitters in yes, the sale. No Sorry, I'm, I'm going to throw a lot of puns in here. <laughs> um, but some of the, the highlights really to start with are probably to do with Gehrig and Ruth. And yeah. Dave, why don't you maybe give us a little insight into their relationship as through a couple pieces we have here in this case. Yeah, not only were Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, you know, teammates, obviously through that 1920s and 30s, almost golden era dynasty of the Yankees. Uh, but, you know, they became almost two players that pushed each other. Uh, they, they would perform obviously at the most elite levels in Major League Baseball history, really. Uh, and although very different stylistically, both in play and also personally, uh, they've created one of those iconic pairs in not just sports history, but really American popular culture history. And here we have a couple of objects. There's a Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig signal sign, or autograph ball signed by each, and then a photograph signed by Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig it's by a noted photographer, Louis Van Ooyen, out of Cleveland. And this is just such a great image because he captures them just in a candid moment, laughing, sitting at the dugout, or in, in the batting cage before a game. And to find vintage sign photography is quite difficult because obviously you would not have had the photograph developed when it was taken and had access to the players at that point. So you had to have access at another point. Uh, so just a spectacular condition example. Uh, and then any of the pieces we're gonna see today, you're gonna note the condition. Uh, and that's something that the home plate collection really uh, has a lot of strength in is, is condition of signature, condition of item. Uh, it's something that this collector really endeavored to do was find the best of any particular object in a given field. Moving on from those two characters, perhaps some of the most iconic people in American history, not only yeah. baseball history, Hollywood history, but Joe DiMaggio and Marilyn Monroe. You can see some really fun candid photos here. Um, and a very kind of personal love letter. I'll let Dave tell you some more about. Yeah, this, this group of materials came right from Joe DiMaggio's personal collection uh, and within a wallet that you see here in the case, there was a folded up letter uh, and it's signed with to Joe and really absolutely poignantly signed by Marilyn Love, your wife for life, Mrs. J.P. DiMaggio. And to our knowledge, it's the only time she ever signed that way. Uh, and, and such a very poignant piece to illustrate that the relationship really uh, was significant. Uh, there was a lot of publicity back in the time period that it was just done almost as a marketing uh, type of a, of a situation. It really wasn't. They had a great relationship, although certainly turmoiled, uh, but absolutely one of the, the most iconic uh, pairs, I guess, in American history, really. Absolutely. And I love that that note is actually written on the back of a dry cleaning receipt. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like we all would to our wives, right? Or absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Worth saving. Um, another interesting and really unique aspect of this collection, I think, is focused here in these few cases, yeah, yeah. Um, was the collector's passion and really deep interest in the 1934 uh, tour of Japan. Um, Dave, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, it was organized in 1934 by a Japanese newspaperman who had been communicating with Babe Ruth and Connie Mack and others for really years trying to get this tour to happen. There had been some other tours of the Orient, but this one was really the first time that Ruth was involved and it was done on a grand scale. Uh, and this particular you know, collector, through the home plate collection, uh, this was one of his focus of, of, of his 30 year collection. Lots of different photography, original sign images. Uh, unique presentational pieces, even matchbooks, you know, with Babe Ruth's image on it. When, when Babe Ruth went over there during that time period, he was arguably 
the most famous person in the world, wow. literally in the world. I and didn't realize that. Thousands and thousands of fans thronged the Japanese streets in Tokyo to see him, and it really invigorated Babe. He came back to the United States thinking, okay, I'm empowered, I can be a, either a baseball manager and what have you, which unfortunately never happened in his life. Uh, but then seven years later, Pearl Harbor occurred, and Babe Ruth was outraged. He was absolutely outraged at what happened to the point uh, we actually worked with his family to sell his, his artifacts, and it was a bronze urn that had a large dent in it. That's because he threw it out of his Riverside apartment in New York when huh. he heard about Pearl Harbor. He was just completely disgusted. So a really significant group of, of you know, American and Japanese artifacts. Yeah, it's just such an interesting moment in diplomacy and history. And maybe here we'll share, there's this fantastic album yeah. um, that it's worth delving a little deeper into. And these were presentational albums given to members of the United States tour. Extremely rare, as you can imagine, because all we, a certain amount were created. So it's got the signatures of all the American players, of course, Babe Ruth at the top, Lou Gehrig, Jimmy Fox, and even Mo Berg, who was not only a baseball player, but ended up being a United States spy, uh, who was working uh, to find out information about the Japanese. And then the Japanese, the Tokyo team, signed as well. But then maybe most interestingly, you have a number of original cabinet photographs of the tour, which are just amazing. They show the, the players, the, the steamships going over to the Orient, Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth being welcomed. Uh, it just, just really an incredible piece that chronicles that entire tour uh, and, and really takes you back to that time when, when baseball had, was just an immensely popular sport and growing in, in popularity even across the world. Amazing. From a few years earlier, we actually yeah. reach our top lot in this sale. Yeah. Um, this amazing 1931 Lou Gehrig jersey. Um, I can play the novice here and just point out what jumps out to me. If you focus in there on the signature or the, the stitched Lou L. Gehrig um, in the collar. Um, but what Dave has taught me is really interesting about this jersey and kind of Fun facts include, if you look at the sleeves, you'll notice they've been shortened. Dave, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, any game-worn jersey from the period of, of a player of this caliber is going to be extremely significant and valuable. Uh, but what we look for is something unique, something that's going to set a particular jersey apart from another. Uh, not only is this date to sort of the pinnacle of Lou's career, right in the middle of where in his, during his MVP and Yankees uh, run, but what's so unique is we found period imagery of this. Uh, and with pinstripe jerseys, you can almost do a fingerprinting technique, if you will, uh, where we do it and third party authentication does it to sort of match up the intersections of where they come with contact in a certain stitch pattern or the yoke area or the buttons. So what we found is in spring of 1931, we have found what appears to be in photographically this jersey with long sleeves as it would have been created. And then we found another image of Lou Gehrig wearing a jersey in September of 1931 with the short sleeves. Why did that happen? If you've ever played baseball, put on a wool uniform with long <laughs> sleeves and play in St. Louis in August when it's 98 degrees, you're gonna cut your sleeves off. <laughs> so it was very, you know, lots of players did it back then, but what makes this one a bit special is it really shows that timeline. It locks it down that this jersey was used really throughout the entire 31 season, and as such is, is really quite a special piece. Fantastic. Thinking more just about broader baseball history, we have a fantastic collection of signed baseballs um, that are here in this case. And maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that inaugural class to the Baseball Hall of Fame. Yeah, if you look up here, you've got the image of the inaugural class. And it's one of those, not only as collectors, but baseball historians, just that was the day. I mean, you think about this collection of players, Babe Ruth, Honus Wagner, G.C. Alexander, Cy Young, Ty Cobb, just an amazing, probably the greatest assemblage of, of baseball players in history on one stage. And the home plate collection features single signed baseballs from those inductees, which is extraordinarily fine in, in one place, if not unique. Uh, and you've got all the greats, Tris Speaker, Cobb, Cy Young, all single signature examples, some with direct provenance to Tommy Connolly, the Hall of Fame umpire or George Moriarty, another umpire, because we look for that direct provenance of where these pieces came from to augment or, or layer on top of the third party authentication. But, you know, Christy Mathewson may be the, the rarest in the group just because he, he passed away of tuberculosis, interestingly, in the 20s. Mm. Uh, and this one's just a wonderful condition specimen. And there's one group piece that we wanted to show, so everybody that can't make it up here. 
Uh, and this is a ball signed by a number of those inductees on one baseball to sort of encapsulate the collection. You've got Babe Ruth, of course in the sweet spot, Walter Johnson and Connie Mack, Eddie Collins, and then a wonderful panel with Honus Wagner and Trish Speaker on the same panel. So again, as evidenced in many of the pieces within this collection, exceptional condition and really premium elite pieces that you can't find in one collection usually. Fantastic. Moving from balls to perhaps one of the, another iconic sector of baseball memorabilia. Yeah. Tell us about the cards we have in this collection. Yeah, I mean, by volume, the home plate collection does not feature many baseball cards. By quality, uh, there are a few collections that can match this type of quality in, in one unique set. Uh, and again, you look at the condition. Here's a Ty Cobb card from 1909 to 11 that's just in nearly pristine condition, one of the highest graded of its type uh, by PSA uh, card grading company. And you've got Babe Ruth, of course, 1933 Gaudi, same thing, a PSA 8 near mint to mint. Uh, and all these different cards, obviously, as the pricing and collectability has evolved over the years, the condition is just so paramount to the value. It really is tied intrinsically to, to it. Uh, and these particular specimens are, are all in just exceptional condition for their particular issue. So uh, in many cases, these are the highest graded examples of the particular card that's here. Fantastic. So obviously, baseball cards were something that were produced um, widely, collected yeah. widely. But now we move to actually one of the most unique, or the most unique um, lot in the entire sale. Yeah. Um, here we have the Lou Gehrig archive um, from Dr. Paul O'Leary of the Mayo Clinic. The, we, we spoke a bit about Gehrig's yeah. career and the highlights um, as he was a ball player, but this really brings us to the end of his career and his life. Yeah, it's so poignant, it really is. Aside from value, aside from collectability, uh, to have this intact archive uh, that was written by Lou Gehrig and Eleanor on his behalf, his wife, Eleanor Gehrig, to Dr. Paul O'Leary at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, and this is from that 1939 to 41 period when Gehrig was suffering. He was failing health-wise. He had had to retire from baseball immediately and seek treatment from a disease that was largely unknown. So the content within some of these letters uh, are just so significant. Him relaying to his doctor how much he appreciated this different treatment or he had heard about this treatment and wanted to try it. Uh, there would be good days where he would feel great and said, I'm on the mend, I'm looking forward to getting back. And then there's days where he demands that the doctor level with him. And mm -hmm. basically you knew through these writings that Gehrig knew he was fatally ill. Uh, and, and again, just a wonderfully important archive uh, that really shows not only how he was feeling at that time period, but as it transgressed, you yeah. see these original handwritten letters by Lou, who had beautiful penmanship. Uh, and then at the end, it went to him having used a rubber stamp or Eleanor Garrick signing on his behalf because he literally could not hold a pen. Yeah, uh, so so heartbreaking. A, yeah, incredible group of things. And anyone who's interested in kind of examining these letters more closely or speaking with us, we're obviously happy to walk you through the full binder because there's just so much here to take in to study yeah. um, and share. So let us know. Um, maybe from here we'll, we'll move from, from that kind of moment into a different kind of history of baseball. Yeah. Very fun, yeah. very uh, recently is. poignant in our election moment. But here we actually have a collection of baseballs signed by US presidents. Yeah, it's, it's something that you sort of know about, or you might have seen a picture or heard about a president attending a game. It doesn't always happen in, in current times, but back starting around Teddy Roosevelt's period or, and William Taft, uh, the presidents attended baseball games. They were, <laughs> and usually for the inaugural game, played each season in Washington, D.C. Uh, they usually threw out the first pitch, and it became in vogue. It became something that they wanted to do. It became something that the nation wanted to see them do. So you will see different objects in different presidents uh, that have signed these different single signature baseballs, ranging all the way from Woodrow Wilson up to you know current uh, with Barack Obama or, or uh, Donald Trump. But then you know really the highlight of the collection is one from Franklin D. Roosevelt. Uh, not only is he one of the more revered presidents in United States history, um, but he's you know very intrinsically tied to baseball mm -hmm. when World War II broke out because very significantly he was communicating with uh, professional baseball 
and told them that they wanted baseball to continue. He wanted the morale to stay up for the country. So anytime you find a specimen like this uh, in the marketplace, it usually does exceedingly well because there just aren't that many that, that have survived. It's so interesting to think of that moment in baseball history and how they were able to pull off this last season as well. Yeah, actually, and, and it's interesting. It really has, that tradition has continued. That's why uh, it's very American, you know, mm. right? It's, it, it, baseball ties into American, you know, culture and, and, and sports and presidential history as well. So obviously we're in New York City right now at Christie's Rockefeller Center, but perhaps in this next case, we're gonna move a little bit further north to Boston. Yeah. We have a great collection of early Red Sox memorabilia. Yeah, don't boo because we're in New York. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody out there is gonna boo. But you know, Babe Ruth started with, with the Boston Red Sox. And when I say started, if you wanna see really at the beginning of his career, here's the, we call it lineup card because it came from the umpire, Tommy Connolly, who is a Hall of Fame umpire. And this is a handwritten, pair of lineups that he wrote out from that day on July 11th, 1914, fairly obscure. I mean, there was a kid named George Ruth who was a promising pitcher. That's pretty much what it was. And here it is, where he played his first game as a member of the Boston Red Sox as a pitcher, by the way, against the powerful Cleveland team who included Nap Lajoie and others, including Shoeless Joe Jackson. So really, again, a very historic piece uh, with direct provenance to a Hall of Fame umpire. Uh, and anytime you see something like that that ties into a player that became iconic that you wouldn't have known was going to be iconic mm -hmm. back then. The rarity is obviously very extreme. Uh, you see period images of Ruth with the Red Sox. Uh, you know, there's obviously an album from Draper and Maynard's family, a uh, popular sporting goods company in New England that has numerous photographs of Babe Ruth and the Red Sox from 1915 and 16, and an autographed guest book from where they stayed at the lodge up there uh, where Ruth had signed as well. So again, finding this kind of quantity, it may not seem like many pieces, but from Babe Ruth on the Red Sox, this is actually as much as you will usually find in any given auction. Actually, from that period is one of our other top highlights. Maybe we'll move to the um, Babe Ruth bat yeah. from his Red Sox days. Yeah, these are a couple of uh, game used baseball bats, professional model baseball bats. Uh, and one of them is particularly significant uh, in that picking up on our theme of, of Boston and, and Babe Ruth, this is one of two known uh, professional model baseball bats that Ruth was issued when he was with the Red Sox, and he used. You'll note the block lettering Ruth on the end because it is predating his Louisville Slugger signature contract, so they didn't have the rights to use the signature yet, interestingly. Uh, and again, it's just an incredibly substantive bat, over 40 some odd ounces. And you think about what that means, the swing back then, now most players use something in the 30 or 33 ounce range. But uh, again, a really historic piece. It's one of the highest graded Ruth professional model bats uh, by PSA DNA uh, and should, should do quite well. Expected to be in that $500,000 to $1 million range. Fantastic. Well, I think that's the majority of highlights. Yeah. There are some other pieces that we welcome you to come in and see in person here at yeah. Christie's. We're actually open by appointment yep. until Wednesday yeah. at noon. The sale is this coming Wednesday, the 16th at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. We welcome you to register with us for telephone bids yeah. or online bids um, and visit our website at christies.com slash baseball. And we're happy to discuss yeah. any of these lots uh, with you on the phone or here in person. Thanks, it's, it's a beautiful uh, setting. It's a great collection. Uh, and again, as Liz mentioned, if anybody has any questions, we're happy to answer them uh, in detail. And we really strongly suggest people take a look, even if you're not interested in bidding all the items, of course, uh, there's so many unique pieces. In my 30 years of doing this, uh, to have a collection like this and be able to see a number of items that you've never seen before, mm. it's really uncommon. So we stress, uh, would like to stress that to any interested parties. Absolutely. Well, it's wonderful to be here with yes. Dave Hunt from Hunt Auctions at Christie's. and. We hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.